that was her only daughter. They were like twins and just wake up one day and she's gone. And life happens, you know, we die, but to die under these circumstances and not to be given answers, it's, it's, it's twice as hard to bear. So you're back with Lauren. What exactly happened to Lauren Smith Fields is the puzzle her family and their attorney, Darnell Crossland, are trying to solve nearly two months after Lauren was found dead in her Connecticut home. Bridgeport police have now announced they're investigating this as a criminal case. But at this point, Lauren's family feels there are still more questions than answers. The 23-year-old Norwalk Community College student and aspiring physical therapist was reported dead on December 12th after a 37-year-old man she met on Bumble called 911. Inside Edition Digital is not naming the man since he has not been named as a suspect. Officials say that man was the last person to see her alive. This police report says he told cops they'd been drinking tequila and Lauren told him she started to feel sick before she went to the bathroom and threw up. The man says she returned, they kept eating, drinking, and watching a movie. The man says Lauren fell asleep on the couch and he carried her to her bed before telling police he fell asleep next to her. When he woke back up at 6.30, he claims she was unresponsive with blood running out of her nose, which is when he called 911. After taking the short statement, police did not consider him a suspect or person of interest in the case. The police didn't do any investigation. They let the guy go without any questioning and they took a slight statement from him. And in that statement, he said that they never had sex. That he slept with his clothes on. But yet still, two weeks after her death, we um, have to force them to collect a condom with semen in it, um, a, a thing of lube, lubricant, a pill that was found on the counter, and a bloody bed sheet. We have to force the police to take it. And to, to this day, those items still have not been submitted to the state forensic laboratory. Attorney Crossland says many people have reached out to his office claiming the man had some sort of personal relationship with the Bridgeport Police Department. I have to say that we're looking to get the phone records of Detective Cronin, who was there at the scene at the same time. Because if his phone records show any call connections to this guy, then you know that we're working with a very corrupt space. Right. And so far, that guy's been he's under investigation by internal affairs and he's just been suspended. There is zero connection between any detectives and my client. So, you know, you look at the situation and when you mention the fact that they might have been racially insensitive or disregarded this family because of their race, people say, well, maybe you're playing a race card. But you don't have to look too far to see Emmett Till or Century Park Five um, and similar cases like that. So to be clear. Effective immediately. Both Detective Lanos and Detective Cronin are suspended from duties and put on administrative leave. Only after Lauren's case started attracting attention on social media did Bridgeport Mayor Joseph Gannam release this Facebook video announcing two detectives, including the lead on Lauren's investigation, have been suspended pending an internal affairs investigation. The officer who was in charge of overseeing the cases retired last week. The medical examiner determined Lauren's cause of death was a mixture of the lethal drug fentanyl, prescription drugs, and alcohol, ruling it an accident. Crossland says he has already started the process to challenge the ME's findings. How did you come up with accidental when there's a guy who this woman never met, she's not a drug user, and there's antihistamines in her body, which are typically used to make people sleepy, drowsy, and typically used in a date rape situation. The day after the Emmy's ruling, Bridgeport police announced they'd switch the case to a criminal investigation. And so why does it need the whole world to respond to this stuff uh, is beyond me. And uh, I don't think it's going to stop anytime soon. So we have to make them pay. We Sometimes the only time to get justice is to make them pay. So that way they realize that the city's going to go bankrupt if this continues. Crossland says they intend to sue the city of Bridgeport for $30 million in punitive damages. Taking on this case has come with another set of challenges. Since we've um, uh, started this case, we've ha gotten every single day emails in all capitals saying, um, you're nothing but a you're playing the race card. Um, and we've gotten phone calls that my receptions are so afraid to even let me hear because they, they leave voice messages every single day. In a statement, Bridgeport's acting police chief, Rebecca Garcia, says they will release a final comprehensive report at the end of their investigation. The DEA is also now investigating. 
Inside Edition Digital reached out to the Bridgeport Police Department. Mayor Ganim, the attorney who is now representing the Bumble Date and Bumble for Comment, along with the police union in Bridgeport, Connecticut. No one has gotten back to us. On social media, Bumble said in a statement they are cooperating with the investigation. The Office of Internal Affairs is handling the personnel investigation. Bridgeport Police will not comment on it. For Inside Edition Digital, I'm Stephanie Officer. Mystery for more than a year that no one seems to have answers to. The young life of Lauren Smith Fields suddenly cut short. Her family left wondering what exactly happened the night she died. When I talk to this family, you know, sometimes the pain is just, it's just unbearable. On December 11, 2021, the 23-year-old from Bridgeport was with a man she met on the dating app Bumble. The next morning, that man called 911 after finding her unresponsive. The office of the chief medical examiner ruled her death an accident, saying she died of a mixture of alcohol and drugs. But the details of what led up to that are still unclear more than a year later. I think the first thing to sense to the family is that we don't care. Attorney Darnell Crosland is representing the family and plans to sue the city of Bridgeport over the handling of this case. He says they're still waiting on public records that might give them the answers they're looking for. We've asked for 911 calls that were made either from that individual to the city or maybe from that individual to other police officers. He says their asks have fallen into a sea of pending Freedom of Information Act requests the city is facing. While it gives us some solace to know that we're not alone, it also highlights the fact that other people are hurting as well. Other people in the city aren't getting answers as well. The city of Bridgeport declined an interview, but confirmed it has almost 3,000 requests open and pending at this time. Last month, officials announced the city will be implementing a new policy that involves each department handling its own requests to address what it called a bottleneck delay. For Smithfield's family, though, the lack of answers from investigators started long before the so-called delay. They were not notified of her death by police, but rather by her landlord. When they w aren't notified when their loved one dies and they come two days later to find, out, find a note on her door, the disregard and disrespect starts right there. That prompted a change on the state level. Lawmakers here at the Capitol passed a law that requires police departments to let families know about their loved one's death within 24 hours. It was passed unanimous, both, both blue and red. It was all green lights um, for yes. And so we're happy that that passed because in the future, other people will benefit from that. An internal affairs investigation into the Bridgeport Police Department's handling of her death has been completed, but what it found continues to be one of the family's many unanswered questions. We haven't gotten the results of the internal affairs. Not a finding of yes, not a finding of no, just nothing. Bridgeport Police also started a criminal investigation into Smithfield's death, led by its narcotics and vice unit. That investigation is still ongoing. Gabby My Molina. problem is that they're saying that the investigation is, is closed. What investigation? They never started an investigation. It took us three days for them to even tell us where her body was located at. We had to keep begging them and calling them to ask them, can you just please tell me where my baby, where my child's are? In December 2021, Lauren Smith Fields and Brenda Lee Rawls died on the same day in the same Connecticut neighborhood. Since then, they say no one from the Bridgeport Police Department has given their families any update on the investigations into their deaths. They want to figure out why. Like, I'm really about to be 25 in two years, like. 23-year-old Lauren Smithfield died on December 12, 2021, after going on a Bumble date with a 37-year-old. Her mother says Bridgeport police never notified them and only found out after physically showing up to her daughter's apartment, where she found a note stuck on the door with a number to call. It belonged to a Bridgeport police detective. Smithfield's family was not happy with their conversation with that detective. He told us to stop calling his phone, that the guy that night was a good guy, leave it alone, just to, to stop calling his phone, talking. Just talking disrespectful, it was crazy. The medical examiner ruled Fields' cause of death accidental, saying she had several drugs in her system, including fentanyl. I spoke with Bridgeport to new police chief Roderick Porter and asked who the Bumble date called when he first discovered Lauren's body. From my, my review of the records, he called 911. Okay. If the records indicate that everything was on the up and up and this person, this Bumble date did call and did 
you know, called 911 immediately. And if the officer responded in an up and up way, then why has it taken so long for that to come out? Yeah, so I, I can't speak to that. Um, you know, I became the chief December 1st. And one of the things that I promised to do was be as transparent and honest as we can. And that's what we're trying to do at this point. So I can't really speak to all of that, but just looking at what I looked at, um, I don't know why there would have been a delay in sharing information with the family. I mean, I, I know that you weren't chief, you know, at that point, but did you know, were you a part of the department at that time? Did you hear anything? Were you made aware, privy to anything that might have indicated why? Um, I was a part of the department at that time. Um, it was before I had left. And uh, um, no, I wasn't privy to uh, what had occurred. Her Bumble date was not charged, and Porter says he was never named as a suspect. Brenda Lee Rawls also died that same day after a visit with a neighbor her sister Dorothy says was someone she used to date. Once her family stopped hearing from her, they went looking. Dorothy says her siblings found out their little sister was dead from that neighbor, who then handed them her clothes. But Rawls' body was not at his house. It was at the medical examiner's office. The ME ruled Rawls died of natural causes, heart disease triggered by diabetes. She was 53. Her family was outraged by how authorities handled her death. The case was never about if she had illness or not. The case is specifically about the fact how they treated my sister like a Jane Doe in death, how they violated her civil rights, how they violated the family's civil rights without even not notifying us. And, and we wanna know what happened that night, who came to get her, what police officer was, was there, Did, was she taken by a, uh, an ambulance or what? Why didn't they question the guy that was there? Why wasn't there tape around? You find somebody dead in your bed in the morning. Who did he call? What about the 911 tapes? How is it possible that the man, the neighbor who, who was friends with your sister, how come he was not questioned? If Do you think he was the last person to see your sister alive? Absolutely. First things first. I don't believe there ever was an investigation. In neither case did Bridgeport police contact either family to notify them of the women's deaths. Both families tell Inside Edition Digital they're gutted. They still don't know the manner in which Lauren Smithfield and Brenda Lee Rawls died, since they question the accuracy of the medical examiner's reports. They say their repeated requests for 911 recordings, police body cam footage, even the woman's personal belongings, including Lauren's cell phone, anything that would give these families insight into the women's last moments have yielded no response. They didn't take that guy's phone that night. They didn't search him nothing. We still haven't got any feedback on what they found on Lauren's phone. We still haven't got her ID back. Any of the items that was that the police took from her that night when she passed, I mean, it's just ridiculous at this point. Darnell Crossland, the attorney for both families, tells Inside Edition Digital. Presumptively, they have body cams and, and right. they tap the body cam. And so um, that that has not been released. Crossland says Brenda Lee Rawls' case is strikingly similar. All the experts that looked at this case says that you treat these cases like a homicide and you dial them backwards as need be. But that's not what happened in these two cases. Yeah, they didn't go to the gentleman's house that she was found at. Um, they didn't try to trace anything to see if there's anything nefarious that happened. They just wrote it off like an accident and and didn't notify anybody. Tell me about what has been going on when it comes to the evidence, the 911 calls in the Brenda Lee Rawls case and the Lauren Smithfield case. What have the families gotten so far? So sure. So since I became chief in December, December 1st of 2022, I've reached out to each each of those families and I've been in contact with each of those families. And thus far, uh, the only family that um, has come in was the Rawls family. And uh, I gave them some documentation, some police reports and things of that nature. Um, the Smith family, we were in contact, but we've not yet secured a time for them to come in. They wanted to speak with their lawyer and uh, they have gotten back to me as of this point. Why did it take so long or why is it taking so long for these families to collect the belongings of their loved ones and to get 911 recordings and police reports and all of the things that many other cases and the loved ones of victims get within hours and days of the initial incident? 
So um, I can't speak to all of that. I can speak to the time that I've been here, but I can say to you, I'm not sure what belongings that they have not been given. Um, I do believe there were some belongings that were that were returned. Um, as I read the reports, I do see um, some notations that there were some belongings that were returned. So I'm not sure what outstanding belongings there are. One small victory came for the Rawls and Fields families in the spring of 2022, when local lawmakers voted unanimously to require police to notify the families of deceased relatives within 24 hours. But a recent Hearst Media Connecticut investigation turned out that the city of Bridgeport has a backlog of more than 2,000 Freedom of Information Act records requests. The law, commonly referred to as FOIA, is how the public, including journalists, can access certain records on public officials, including police body cam footage, in order to hold tax-funded government entities accountable. Connecticut Insider reports that despite Bridgeport Mayor Joseph Gannam's promise for transparency, he and his administration have done little, if anything, to address the years-long backlog. The head administrator just came out now and said that in order to make FOIA requests um, more effective, they're going to have the departments that, that the request is going to answer their own FOIA because there was a bottleneck. So they're saying instead of doing that, they'll just have the fire department answer their own FOIA requests, the police answer their own, Board of Education answer their own. And I know that Mayor Ganim has come out and said they want to streamline the process. That's something you just referred to. Mm -hmm. So when is that happening? Is that now? Is there a set date? Has it already happened? So in terms of uh, these two cases, we've begun the process of reaching out to give information um, as it relates to the FOIA process. I'm not sure everything that they're looking for, but we have made overtures to have them come in and give out information. He turned down a request to appear on camera, but through his spokesperson, Mayor Ganim tells Inside Edition Digital that FOIA training in Bridgeport began during the second week of March, 2023. When asked about the previous police chief who oversaw the investigation before Chief Porter took it over, Mayor Ganim said it was a personnel matter. When asked whether his office could send over any police body cam footage, 911 call tapes or transcripts, he told me to file a FOIA request. Chief Porter told Inside Edition Digital their investigation turned up no evidence of foul play in Brenda Lee Rawls' death. If it was so well done, then why the hesitation from the Bridgeport Police Department? And, you know, I had reached out to the police department back then. Mm -hmm. I reached out to the mayor back then and no one would say anything. If it was done on the up and up, then why not just come out and say, hey, this was done and, and avoid the speculation and avoid the frustration from the families? No, I mean, I think there were some things that we could have done better. I mean, there's definitely mm -hmm. were things that could have done that should have done better. Our communication to the family definitely could have done, been done a, a whole lot better. And, um, you know, so we're trying to improve upon that. Um, and uh, we're trying to be transparent. Um, you know, I arranged to or tried to make arrangements to meet, meet with each family prior to being contacted by you for any interviews or anything like that. The sentiment in this across both cases is that, you know, had these two women been of a different race, we wouldn't even be having this conversation, right? The thought is that when it comes to these types of cases, Black women are constantly just shoved aside. You know, we don't get as much attention or care as maybe some women of other races. What mm -hmm. do you have to say to that? No, I, I would say sadly, uh, you know, in many respects, sometimes that is true. Um, you know, sometimes it's perception, sometimes it is reality. Um, but not just black women, but, you know, black people in general. Um, but, um, you know, that's a sad commentary on where we are. But uh, I can say that's something that I would not tolerate, something that I don't condone, something that we are, are really trying to make sure it doesn't occur again. Connecticut Governor Ned Lamont has not responded to Inside Edition Digital's multiple requests for comment. The Fields family intends on bringing a $30 million lawsuit against the city of Bridgeport. Once you get this information, after all this fighting yields whatever it yields, what's next? Well, for me, the officers that was there at my daughter's apartment, I want them, I want them to be held accountable for how they act. Um, my plan to move forward is to concentrate on helping others. And in January 9th, I opened my private practice. I'm a, nurse, I'm a psychiatric mental nurse practitioner. Mm -hmm. My plan is to throw myself into helping others who suffer from mental illness. My private practice is called My Sister's Keeper. 
and it's dedicated to my sister Brenda. Hopefully in efforts not to remember them by the way they died, but instead to hold Lauren Smithfield and Brenda Lee Rawls' memories by the way they lived and as their families described them as joyous <sighs> questions about the police investigation into the dating app death of a young woman, Lauren Smith Fields in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Investigative reporter Sarah Wallace delves into that mystery. They wanted us to forget about our daughter, their sister, our loved one. They, they thought they was gonna just throw her away like she was. Garbage. Amid this family's anguish are emotions of outrage and disgust at how the Bridgeport Police Department has investigated the mysterious death of 23-year-old Lauren Smith Fields. It was careless. It was no concern. There was no, like, care for the family about how we felt our grief, our pain, none of that. The I-Team obtained this police report of the response to a 911 call from Lauren's apartment on the morning of December 12th from a white male identified as Matthew LaFountain. The investigator notes he was trembling and visibly shaken. LaFountain said they met on the dating site Bumble, began drinking shots of tequila, and Lauren became ill. That later they played some games, ate some food, and started to watch a movie. He says he carried her to her bedroom and laid her in her bed. He then laid down next to her and fell asleep. He woke up again at approximately 0630 hours and she was laying on her right side. Blood was coming out of her right nostril onto the bed and she was not breathing. The whole day goes by. No police reach out to the family at all. Her close-knit family says they went to the apartment the next day after frantically calling and texting Lauren and were referred to a Detective Cronin. They didn't even contact us. They didn't let us know anything. It's like crazy. And I'm asking him what's going on. He said she met some guy on Bumble. And I'm asking him about the guy. He was like, oh, he sounds like a really nice guy. He sounds like a really good guy. And he was like, uh, I'll call you back. and just hung up in my face. They say the detective promised to come by the apartment. Never showed up. The family says the relationship with police devolved from there. No contact from December 13th until December 29th. They returned to the apartment to clear out Lauren's belongings and claim a new detective came by to say he'd taken over the case from Detective Cronin. The detective said he effed up, he messed up, he effed Cronin, he messed up, he like he didn't know what he was doing, he messed up the case. The family says they provided evidence they'd collected to crime scene investigators who arrived for the first time that day included a bloody sheet and a pill and two cups of like drinks or whatever next to a bottle they didn't take none of that we seen a condom we seen a uh, lube uh, other stuff in there and they didn't take none of this sources close to the investigation tell the i team the matthew lafountain pictured in this social media photo now removed was the man at lauren's apartment a neighbor at his listed address in milford confirmed lafountain's identity but we were unable to reach the 37 year old who has not been accused of any wrongdoing lafountain's same image appeared under the name matthew thomas now also taken down anyone that genuinely cared and they were there the last person there and they know that nothing bad happened, you would at least even reach out to the family yourself. Like, listen, exactly. I know, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for your loss of your daughter or your sister. The family's last contact with police was on January 4th at headquarters with their attorney. What I believe is that the police failed to collect and preserve that environment from the first day. The attorney has now filed a notice of claim to sue Bridgeport for negligence, claiming key evidence was not initially submitted to the state lab. I feel like because she's a white guy and she's a black girl, it's just almost like they're just throwing it under the rug. That night she was silenced, so now we are her voice. But we're here and we're fighting for her. The Bridgeport Police Department did not respond to repeated messages we left about the case. But in previous statements, they've said the investigation is open and active and that detectives are waiting for a final report from the medical examiner on the cause and manner of death. Sarah Wallace, News 4 New York. Also, we just received a statement from the dating site Bumble that Sarah mentioned. A spokesperson says we are deeply saddened by news of Lauren Smith Field's death and have reached out directly to the family to offer support. We've been in contact with law enforcement, 
but they have not yet requested any information. Two detectives suspended for their handling of the investigation into the death of Lauren Smith Fields. She's the college student from Bridgeport, Connecticut, who died after going on a date with someone she met on a dating app. For weeks, her family has questioned how the department has handled her investigation. And tonight, the mayor is blasting the probe and putting two officers on leave. And there are new questions about another woman who died under similar circumstances. News 4's Anjali Hemphill is in the newsroom with the major new developments tonight. Anjali? Gilma, tonight the Bridgeport mayor made a public apology to the two victims' families and said both cases have now been reassigned to other members of the police department. And I want you to know that I am extremely disappointed with the leadership of the Bridgeport Police Department and have found the actions taken up to this point with regards to these two investigations unacceptable. Scathing remarks Sunday night from Bridgeport Mayor Joe Gannam regarding his police department's handling of two women's mysterious deaths on the same day in the same neighborhood. After viewing these matters even more closely, and in the absence of the police chief, I've directed the deputy chief, Chief Moraha, to immediately put on administrative leave the two officers who are the subject of the Bridgeport Police Internal Affairs investigation. Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. Last month, 23-year-old Lauren Smith Fields was found dead in her apartment after a date with a man she had met on the dating app Bumble. Investigators say she had fentanyl, prescription drugs, and alcohol in her system that resulted in what the medical examiner ruled was an accidental overdose. So fentanyl is the top drug, and then they have a, a couple other drugs they found in her system that are typically associated with date rape drugs. It was careless, it was no concern, there was no, like, care for the family about how we felt our grief our pain none of that news 4 spoke exclusively to her family last week who say the bridgeport police have not properly investigated her death or taken the case seriously meanwhile the family of another woman 53 year old brenda rawls have made similar allegations against the department and she have family that loves her and we're gonna miss her and we'll never forget her we're always going to have this pain in our heart for her. Rawls was also found dead in Bridgeport. And like Smithfield's family, they say police never even notified them of her death. Both these deaths happened not only in the 138 district, but the exact same precinct on the same day. So we have a lot of commonality here. And for me, this is becoming frightening. And as questions continue to swirl about the police department's handling of both cases. <laughs> These families say they will continue to demand answers. You're not going to be satisfied with an internal affairs investigation. No, I want an outside investigation. We want the Department of Justice to come in and do their own investigation. And also tonight, the Smithfields family attorney called the mayor's statement and actions a step in the right direction. Live in the newsroom, Anjali Hemphill. A young school. woman in Bridgeport, Connecticut, who died last month under very suspicious circumstances. Lauren Smith Fields was found in her apartment by the man she had had a date with the night before. Her family accuses police of mishandling this investigation. Newly released autopsy results conclude that her death was, quote, an accident. Lise Preston is here with more on the story. You're back again from yesterday, Lise. It's very troubling. The more we hear, the worse it seems to get. It's very concerning. Good morning, Gail. Preliminary results from the state paint the first real picture of how Smithfields died. The medical examiner found Smithfields died of acute intoxication from a combination of drugs and alcohol. The results showed fentanyl in her system along with two other drugs. The autopsy says the combination of those substances with alcohol led to what it calls an accidental death. In a video statement last night, the family attorney said they believed there was foul play. Someone introduced those drugs to her system and it wasn't her. And we want answers right now. Now, the attorney did not explain how the family knows she did not take the drugs herself. The man hasn't been charged and is not considered a suspect, so we are not naming him. According to the police incident report, Smithfields' date told police that two spent the night drinking, eating, and watching a movie. At one point, he said she went outside to meet someone and later fell ill, but the two continued drinking. Smithfields allegedly fell asleep, and hours later, around 6.30 in the morning, the date says he woke up next to Smithfields, not breathing, and called 911. The full autopsy results will not be made public, but the family can request it. Smithfields' family is also still waiting on its own private autopsy results, which are expected within the month.
This is so troubling, Elise, because, listen, the autopsy doesn't show how the drugs got into her system. So we still don't know that, and we are just to believe what the man says. The man who, by the way, has not been identified publicly. Right. He, he could say anything. He, he could say anything. We have not identified him. We have reached, we have tried to reach out and make contact. We have not been able to do so. But the family has been questioning from the very beginning, has she been drugged? They found, they say they found an unidentified pill in the home. Mm -hmm. They said they sent that or they had police take it for processing. We call the state lab. They don't have anything in their possession related to Smithfields' death. And we're not identifying him because he's not been charged? He has not been charged. He is not a person of interest, according to police. Well, I think just how the family responded yes. to how the police didn't really listen to their calls for concern is, is also disturbing. Mm -hmm. Elise, thank you. I can go on and on about Lauren and, you know, so many different memories and, like, all the years that we spent together. I do want to say that Lauren, before her passing, like within the last couple of years, she became more spiritual with herself. I feel like that gives me some type of acceptance that her soul is okay because here she was trying, but Lauren was never the one to take drugs. Like absolutely not even marijuana, like absolutely nothing like that. She never needed it. Like. Honestly, she, the girl was just a ball of life. Like she was what, you know, what people would say high off life. I've been in media for so long, I might be a little desensitized to really uh, caring if somebody is going to pick up a story or because I'm so used to it being ignored. So sometimes it takes us building our own platforms and making our own space and creating our own tables for um, our stories to be told. Smithfield's 24th birthday. Year old Bye. Lauren Smithfield was found dead in her Bridgeport, Connecticut apartment after going. I have an update for you guys in regards to the case of Lauren Smithfields and Brenda Raw. So I first heard about Lauren Smithfield's case back, uh, I think it was like mid to late December, and it was actually a follower had asked me to look into it. You know, what immediately struck me was how little information there was. This was a woman who had died under mysterious circumstances, but they were talking about how the police said that they weren't looking into the guy that was last with her. And that just really, it honestly just really irked me and made me really angry. And so I decided to post about it and share all the information that was out there, which was you know, close to nothing. Please share Lauren's story. The more attention this story gets, the more likely the Bridgeport Police Department will do a proper investigation and get Lauren's family answers. We know that some scenes are just failed because the officers on scene didn't realize that there was something going on. But when you have a scene that is so clear, this is a stranger. It's inside of her home. There is questions about the scene. I don't understand why you wouldn't. And the only thing I can say is it leads exactly what we've always been talking to, which is the officers on scene are not taking black women seriously. They just thought of her as, well, it must be an overdose. <laughs> is there anything about her case that stood out to you? Something that surprised you at all? After Gabby Petito's disappearance and all of the conversation around the lack of equitable coverage, I was hopeful going into the future that maybe we'd see some differences in coverage. And so for me, seeing Lauren's case, it was, um, it actually hit me pretty hard to see that social media was so far ahead of the mainstream media because it was a really stark reminder of how far we have left to go when it comes to the missing white woman syndrome. The missing white woman syndrome is a term that was coined by um, the late and amazing journalist Gwen Eiffel. And it essentially refers to the fact that the media overrepresents stories about white missing women and girls compared to missing women and girls of color. Um, I never set out for our black 
girls to be an organization or a nonprofit. I just wanted to do something to add my voice to a cause. Um, as I saw these girls and these women that look like me, they look like my friends, they look like my family members. Historically, Black women have not been seen as full people. I mean, even as simple as going to the doctor and saying that you're in pain, as simple as the mortality rate when it comes to um, pregnancy and birth within Black women. Our pain, our voices are often the last. Even when it comes to dating, if you talk about dating apps, we're the, most, we're the least desirable. Take me back to the moment when you first heard about Lauren's case and why were you compelled to become involved? Um, I thought it was important to be involved in a case like this because um, I I'm living in an era where um, Black lives aren't valued the same as white lives. Um, and I mean that from a systemic standpoint, not from my neighbor or friends that I know who are white or other or from other races, but systemically, um, whether it's implicit biases or straight out racism, it's something that devalues our lives. So when I heard how her daughter was just disregarded, et cetera, um, I said I was all in. So um, I signed up right away and um, we've been working ever since. So according to the autopsy report, Smith died of acute intoxication due to the combined effects of fentanyl, alcohol, and prescription medication. What does Lauren's family want us to know about her? The mother wants, you know, the biggest misconception about this case is this implication that she was using drugs. The idea that the, um, the, the idea that the medical examiners would say this was an accidental overdose leads people to believe that she was using drugs and just took too much. That's a misconception. She wasn't using drugs and took too much. She doesn't use drugs. And so you get some negative people saying, oh, that's what it was. She, she was just a drug user. And now they're saying it's race. No, that's not right. Um, and aside from that, she wants you to know that her daughter was beautiful, ambitious. She was in college studying to be a physical therapist. She was just a great kid. And she's a kid. That's, that's what it was. She was 23. Can you talk about the ideal victim stereotype and explain the treatment of white victims versus black and brown female victims by the criminal justice system? So when I think about the ideal victim stereotype, I think it's important to point out that in the United States, we actually have a very long history of white women and girls being viewed as the ideal victim. Um, the ideal victim is essentially a person or a group that when they are victimized, they're believed to be innocent, blameless, and deserving of protection. And in essence, the ideal victim is somebody who is worthy of our collective attention, but is also viewed as worthy of the collective resources as well. So in my research, we found that women who do not conform to this ideal victim stereotype do tend to be shown as being somehow responsible for their victimization. So some examples of victim blaming statements might be that they're using alcohol or drugs or that they're dressed in a particular way or maybe that they have associations with people that have an arrest history. There is some research out of the Pointer Institute that actually shows that most people engage with news stories through the photograph, the headline, and the caption. And so something that really struck me in some of the stories about Lauren is that she was framed in a photo of her with a bikini, which I think is just um, so striking on so many levels and, and in this case, so inappropriate to what the story is actually about. And you know, research shows that um, women of color are often um, sexualized in ways that um, white women are not. And I think that that was a very clear example of that. So social media, specifically TikTok and Instagram, have been instrumental in bringing national attention to Lauren's story and keeping it alive. The rapper Cardi B was also instrumental in raising awareness about the case and that her tweeting about it was significant. Would police have taken this case seriously had social media and celebrities like Cardi B not gotten involved? Um, you know, absolute answer is no. You know, with Gabby Petito, um, the national media um, should be ashamed of themselves because they they, parking, they they went right after the story, her story, and they wouldn't stop. It was it was relentless. CNN, etc. Um, and they said to us, uh, said to me, if it wasn't for social media, or what role did I think social media played? And my answer is clear. Social media was like Harriet Tubman and the Underground Railroad. 
you had to do whatever you had to do to get to the freedom that you were seeking. So if these national media companies didn't take us seriously as they did Gary Petito, we started underground with TikTok and social media. It was only when, when we got those followers that the big giants like CNN and the rest of them start calling us. You, you, you could bet your bottom that if it wasn't for the groundswell in social media and the underground um, movement that we started, they wouldn't call us. I think that TikTok is unique in its algorithm and the way that videos can go viral. I mean, I've literally seen products sell out because of a viral TikTok video. So I just don't think it would have reached as many people had it not been for the TikTok videos that went viral about it. And, and I, I think that if it hadn't reached that many people, I mean, maybe they would have done a criminal investigation, but I don't think the whole uh, internal affairs investigation into the detectives. I don't, I honestly don't think that that would have happened because it would have just been the family who was outraged, not so many people around the world. In your ideal world, what would justice for Lauren look like? For us, justice can never really be achieved until we stop losing young girls like Lauren. I know here on earth, she was a very good soul. So I know in the afterlife, God needed his angel back, obviously. Like, he just wanted her back. So I think that gives me peace of mind that, you know, she was very in tune with herself. So I know she's okay.